Hello again. Um, my name is Pierre Valentin, uh, and it's a great honor and pleasure to um, invite uh, Edmund de Waal um, to um, address us. Um, uh, Edmund is um, an artist, a master potter, a writer, might I even say a philosopher? Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of philosophy in some of your books. Um, I had the, 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 the good luck of um, listening to Edmund uh, at a conference, well, listening to Edmund sharing his family story at a conference on Nazi looted art probably five or six years ago. Um, it was fascinating, and I, I can tell you the entire audience, there must have been 500 people in that um, uh, auditorium were um, literally hanging on Edmund's every word. I'm sure uh, everyone here will hang on his every words, um, every word today. Uh, before I, I hang on and hang over, I, I hand over uh, the microphone to um, Edmund. Um, if you're interested to see um, his work, uh, head to the Burlington Arcade, um, where uh, Edmund has taken over the Gagosian space. Uh, the exhibition brings together uh, recent artworks, treasured objects, and a selection of um, books that's been curated by Edmund. Um, the show is um, open until the 23rd of December, and immediately after that, hop on a bus or in a taxi and go down to the Haywood Gallery, gallery um, on the South Bank, where uh, you can see um, a beautiful artwork by Edmund called Atmosphere. It's part of an exhibition um, called Strange Clay, C Ceramics um, in Contemporary Art. And that's on until the 8th of January. Thank you so much. It's a huge honor and, and pleasure to be with you today. And, and, and the word keynote is enough to, to make everyone run for the hills, I must say. Um, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about legacy and to talk about the complexity of, of, of this, this fissile, untidy, generative nature of what inheritance might mean. And I'm starting really in the autumn of 1994, when I went back to Tokyo to the funeral of my great uncle, Ignace von Efrissi, Iggy, a Jewish Viennese beloved uncle of mine who had ended up in Japan after the war and who I got to know over my many trips to Japan from childhood onwards. And I went back to bury him with his partner, Jiro, by my side in an extraordinary Buddhist temple on the outskirts of Tokyo. And Jiro did the Shinto and Buddhist prayers, and I said Kaddish for my Japanese, Jewish, Viennese, Tokyo living, cosmopolitan, beloved great uncle. And then we went back to Iggy's apartment. And Jiro asked me to help sort out Iggy's clothes. And I opened the cupboards in his dressing room and saw the shirts ordered by color. And as I packed the ties away, I noticed that they mapped their holidays together in London and Paris and New York. And when this job was done over a glass of wine, Giro took out his brush and ink and wrote a document and sealed it. It says, he tells me, that once he has gone, I should look after the Netsuke, so I'm next. So what do I do with this collection of 264 small, complicated, beautiful, funny, sometimes erotic little ivory objects in my house in Camberwell? My children are growing up and my father is growing old and not talking. He's never talked about Vienna. There's nothing to say, he says. There's no story there. And I realize that I'm not entitled to nostalgia 
I'm not entitled to melancholia, that default vagueness. But I have to work with what I've been given. And I'm interested because objects and how objects are handed on is all about storytelling. The territory of the sinuous intertwining of things with memories, favored, favorite things that you can put away or pass on. How objects are handled is all about storytelling. I'm giving this because I love you or because it was given to me, because I bought it somewhere special, because you will care for it, because it will complicate your life, because it will make someone else envious. There is no easy story in legacy. What is remembered, what is forgotten. There can be a chain of forgetting, the rubbing away of previous ownership, as much as the slow accretion of stories. What is being passed on to me with all these small Japanese objects? That's the beginning of The Hair with Amber Eyes. A book that took me a long time. It took me a long time because I actually have a day job. I make pots. I make porcelain. This is my living, going to the studio and sitting at my wheel and making objects. But I can go up one of two staircases in my studio in South London up to my small studio where I make porcelain or up to a space it's never ever as clean and tidy as this, which is a space full of books and shards and objects. Shards and objects will come back to brokenness. That's your next conference, Teresa. So to inherit this, to inherit these, but to inherit some parts of a story, some parts of a broken story and some silences, what do you do? And I made a pact with my wife that I would take six months and I would start a story six months and still married to her, bless her. It took seven years. And I knew that the story began here in the Rue de Monceau. I knew that my family was Jewish. I knew that they were Jewish and that they'd come from Odessa like so many families in the 1860s to Paris to build extraordinary, wonderful buildings around the new Parc Monceau. The Rothschilds were doing the same things, the commandos down the road, the Ephrises, my family, ridiculously rich on grain, were doing what all good Jewish families do, which is to secure their dynastic inheritance, secure their inheritance make sure something endured. Again, words that run through this day. So they built their beautiful house. And this is where the daughter and the three sons arrive in the 1860s. The first is the banker and marries the right Jewish girl. The second is a, a lover of women, which means that I have more French cousins who emerged after the publication of the book than I thought possible. And the third is young and rich and starts buying art, Charlotte Frissi. He buys Medici embroideries. This had M for M Medici and he put E for F Frissi. It's the kind of person he was. And here he is at the back of his friend Renoir's painting, the great collector, the great animator of contemporary art, the person who buys art off the easels. These are part of his collections. You all know because you know where art is, where these now belong. This Chicago damn them. This, unfortunately, in the National Gallery, I take my children to weep. But he's buying extraordinary things and making friends amongst the art of the day. And Proust becomes his first secretary and walks up those steps 
uh, in the Rue de Monceau, um, and Charles F. Roussy slowly becomes Charles in A la Rechef de Pompadou. And this, this wonderful painting, which he buys off the easel, it's 800 francs, he gives a thousand because he's generous. And then a week later, this is left at the doorstep of number 81, the Rue de Monceau, this one has slipped from the bundle and the story ends up in Proust. And he's a great collector. He's a great writer on Dura. And people ask, why did I call my book The Hair with Amber Eyes? And the short answer is, the long answer is that I asked my children what we should call it after their favorite Netsky. And they all came up with the rat gnawing the bone and the naked lady in the bathtub. And I chose the hair with amber eyes. But here he is in old age and he grew out, fell out of love with these, fell out of love with the Japanism that he lived with. And so in 1899, he sends this incredible collection of early Netsuke all the way across, Paris, across Europe to Vienna, where his favorite, favorite first cousin, my great grandfather Victor, is getting married. He sends it as a wedding present to our family home in Vienna, which is bigger than the Paris cousins. It takes up one whole block of the Ringstrasse, and it's pretty grim inside, too. But this is where my Viennese Jewish family have settled to make sure that everyone knows that they are not wandering Jews, that they have settled and become Viennese. And this is the place that my family grow up. And Victor, my great-grandfather, scholarly, rabbinical, a great book collector, and we'll come back to that, but a book collector who didn't put his book plates in his books, he didn't put his name in his books, is marrying in a hurry, a great hurry, the Baroness from the palais next door, because his elder brother, who was supposed to inherit, has run off with their father's mistress. You have to think about that relationship. And you have to remember that Freud, a family friend, lives across the road. So Victor, my great grandmother, marries Emmy, my rather wonderful great grandmother. Here she is in normal dress in the salon of the Palais Ephrussi. It's a house which is crammed with art. The Parisians collect. But my grandmother, acidic, clever, literate, said that they just shopped, but they shopped at scale. This is a house full of art. And this couple put that vitrine of Netsuke in Emmy's dressing room. And this is where the children grew up. This is my grandmother and my great aunt Gisela. And these objects, which were in a salon, in Paris become playthings for children in the Palais Ephrussi. And they grew up here, and my great, my grandmother Elizabeth, this is the family house, looks across from her bedroom window, across into the University of Vienna, and she fights to get there. She becomes, this month is wonderful, this month is the centenary of her graduating. She's the first woman lawyer in Austria, a fearsome, wonderful woman, a poet. And she escapes, marries, leaves, and Iggy, who's supposed to be a banker, runs away to pa Paris, then runs away to New York to become, in his words, the worst fashion designer on the East Coast of America. And 38, and the Anschluss. And the Anschluss is, of course, 
the dismantling, the looting, the taking apart, both at speed and with violence. Emmy and Victor are beaten up. Victor is forced to scrub the street outside the Palais de Fussy. Emmy is assaulted and has her jewelry ripped from her. But it's also the dismantling by art historians who care for records of the family collection. The day after the Anschluss, the director of the Kunsthistorische Museum arrives with members of the Gestapo to start making lists of what will go where. Art historians are part of that slow and then quick dismantling of the family's life. Records are taken, but no record is taken of the library of my great grandfather, Victor, which is put on a lorry in April 1938 and driven out of the family house and has not been found since. And my grandmother goes back and gets them to their house in Czechoslovakia, where my great grandmother, Emmy, commits suicide. And Victor finally escapes to England with my grandmother and my father and my uncle. And I spend too long in archives. You all spend time in archives. I spend too long in archives. But my family arrive in England, most of them. And this is where Victor von Ofrissi, born in Odessa, Viennese citizen, dies in 1945. And Iggy in America joins the American army and fights on D-Day. And you can see he writes his sister's name on his Jeep on D-Day. And after the war, Elizabeth goes back to Vienna, to a ruined Vienna. She writes of it. And she goes back to the palais where there is nothing apart from some furniture too heavy, she said, for the Gestapo to loot. And there she meets her mother's maid, Anna, who has kept the Netsuke collection. It's the only thing to be handed back. And Iggy sees this after the war, a displaced, deracinated man who can't live anywhere anymore. And he sees it and he says, I know where it's going, it's going home. A homeless man says this, and he chooses Tokyo. And in 1946, Iggy takes a briefcase with the Netsuke and he builds a house and a vitrine for the collection in Tokyo. And here you see it in his first house he builds. And this is where he meets his partner, Jiro, who only died four years ago, my beloved Japanese uncle. And they live together in great style with vitrines of Netsuke and parties. And they open up the vitrine and hand the objects round. And this is where the objects take on this other life. Dessa, of course, Paris, Vienna, Tokyo. And when they die, and this is their grave, which I go and tend as the next part of this chain of legacy, they come back to me, to London. And this takes years. It takes me to Odessa. It takes me to this beginning, the place, the first house, this beloved city now under such fearsome threat. This is the family house looking across the Black Sea. And when I go to all these archives in all these sequential places, I take an object with me and I try and work out what has been handed on and what I need to hand on in my turn. What do I do with these? 
I write a book. And what happens with the book is extraordinary because I write a book thinking it's going to be a book which will mean something to my children and mean something to my father, but will have this amount of bandwidth. It's turned down by so many publishers who say there is no market for family memoir. And when it's published, it does have a public. And I start to receive the thousands and thousands of letters that I've had over the last decade. And we launch it in Vienna, in the Palais of Fussi, in this house. This is the courtyard of the house where on the night of the Anschluss, a famous French desk was tipped over and destroyed with the words, you will be next. And I take my father and Giro comes and my father, the first time the family have been there, since 1938, says to my two children, having said that he cannot remember, he cannot remember anything about Vienna, he takes my children and says, let me show you around my house. So you write a book, and then what do you do? Five years ago, we made a decision and we gave our family archive to the Jewish Museum in Vienna. Boxes and boxes of things. And we put on long-term loan the Netscape collection so that it could tell a different kind of story in a place that mattered. And three years ago, just before the pandemic, we were back. And at the Jewish Museum, here's my father with his portrait. My father, Jewish, in a complicated way, became the Dean of Canterbury. <laughs> so I grew up with a father with a strong Viennese accent who was Christian, who wouldn't talk about what had happened. But growing up in the deanery in Canterbury, a beautiful medieval house, there are portraits of all the deans going back to the Reformation. Extraordinary collection since 1550. And my father was asked who he wanted to paint his portrait. And he said, I have a Viennese cousin, Marie-Louise von Montaschitsky, a great, wonderful painter who was a friend of Beckmann, a great painter who had also ended up in, after the Anschluss here in, in, in London. She'll paint me. She was a great artist. And there's a great catalogue resume, I mean, of the Marie-Louise collection. They do wonderful things. And Marie-Louise, who was fierce and wonderful and complicated, Viennese, I think, is probably the way of putting it. Said to my father, I will paint you, but you can't see the portrait until it's unveiled. Risk. And it was unveiled in the deanery by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and she painted him as a rabbi. And she said, you might be the Dean of Canterbury, but you're still a Jewish boy. And here on the night of the opening of our family exhibition in Vienna is my father being greeted by the president of Austria who announced that evening that Holocaust era families were working to be allowed to reclaim their citizenship, would be encouraged to reclaim their citizenship, to be given their citizenship back. So my father, still with us, is now also an Austrian citizen. Legacy, agency, what do you do? This is the exhibition which has just closed in the Jewish Museum in New York, where the whole of that floor of that extraordinary Warburg mansion was filled with the paintings that we have 
the paintings we know, things you know from the Musée d'Orsay, and the paintings uh, that were born to Charles that are now in museums across the world, and the objects that were found. This is the great Torah uh, curtain from the, from the Stadt Temple in Vienna, from, given by my great grandmother. Paintings that have been restituted, paintings that have been lost, uh, grayed out, all moments of archival memory in the documents that were drawn up by librarians and art historians as part of that extraordinary dismantling of collections that we're still 90 years, 80 years on trying to reconvene and recover. And this was the final room with my vitrine uh, bought from the VNA 10 years ago with the Netscape briefly back in there. And that was interesting. And that's one kind of way of dealing with legacy. Where does your archive go? Not necessarily with the family, pass it on. Where do you have things? You have them where they make the most impact, not necessarily hanging on to them or commodifying them or doing anything else with them. But it's complicated. And because I'm an artist, I try and make these kinds of stories and possibilities have a wider kind of resonance. So it takes me to all kinds of places of difficulty. It took me during the last Venice Biennale to work in the ghetto in Venice, to work in these extraordinary synagogues, to be the first contemporary artist to be allowed to put works in these extraordinary and sacred spaces, works which deal with the Psalms. This one's called Tehillim, work to do with, this is in the sukkah, high up. This is a piece which I made for this very beautiful room, high up above uh, the synagogue in the ghetto. And I just met someone who visited it there. And this piece I've now given to the new National Library of Israel. So in a year's time, it will be in Jerusalem. Um, things, as Michael so eloquently said, move round the world. You can't tell their stories for what is going to happen. Uh, what you can do is make things happen in your lifetime and pass them on as much as you can. So I made a library for my great grandfather, Victor. I'm never going to find that library. But I made a library of exile which was full of 2,000 books written by 80 different languages, uh, written by people who had been forced into exile, refugees, exiles from Ovid to the present day. And I put an installation in there, which is also going to Jerusalem. And I put book plates, ex libris plates, so that people could write their names in the books that mattered to them. And Ben Okri opened the proceedings and it was wonderful. And we had hundreds and hundreds and then thousands of people. And I made a category mistake, which I will share to you, which in my enthusiasm, I put a box which said, if there is a book that you feel should be in the Library of Exile, write its name and I will buy it. I pass this on for your edification. And it's wonderful because 4,000 books ended up in the Library of Exile. And it went on, it was a mobile library. And I think everything we're talking about is about the movement of stories and objects and art. This was a mobile library. It went next to the Yapanisha Palais, to this extraordinary place, which of course, was both Augustus the Strong's great palace of porcelain, but also a great library bombed in 1945. And this was the space where Victor von Klemperer, one of my great heroes, wrote his diary. Uh, and here it had a different presence from, from Venice and we worked with refugee groups um, and to make extraordinary connections across Dresden, and across Saxony. And this was its second place, its second outing. And again, it was full of people, full of children. And so a lost library, my great, wonderful, 
scholarly great grandfather's precious library becomes a place where people can take down the tiger that came to tea by Judith Kerr, that great refugee, and write one name after another after another because it's mattered to them or mattered to their children. And then what happens? It comes to the British Museum, and then finally, beautifully, it gets dispersed. So you're talking and thinking about how to hold things together. And I'm talking about migration and dispersal. So what happens? The four installations in it go to different corners of the world. The structure of the library is to become the new reading room of the new Warburg Library in London, another exiled library, which I love. Isn't that cool? And the books are taken to Mosul. And they are now part of the rebuilt university library in Mosul and have their own special corner in a library that was destroyed by ISIS. So when you're next in Mosul, you can go and pick up a book by Geshem Shalom or Ovid or Judith Kerr and find hundreds and hundreds of names because it's one story talking deeply to another. And most recently, don't worry, I'm not locking you in. One final story, which takes me back to the Rue Monceau. Because as Michael said, if you're an artist and you think you can establish your legacy forever, he didn't say this, this is me reading Michael and talking to him now. Michael, you're absolutely right, you cannot secure your legacy. It's into history, it's into other people's hands. What you can do is be clear and walk away. And this is the story of someone who is clear and it's painful because just 10 houses down from our family house in Paris, the Efrussi house is this extraordinary place, the Museum Nestine de Camondo. It's beautiful beyond belief. It's an astonishing place. It's also another part of my family. My grandmother in Paris in the 1920s used to visit her cousins here. Beatrice Camondo married an Efrissi and had two children. And you might know this place and know it's incredible collections of French furniture. We even have a child. There's someone here who has a son at the Ecole Camondo. Yes, there you go, just across the courtyard. But if you go upstairs, there's an archive. There's rooms and rooms of archives. There's rooms of dusty furniture and cupboards full of objects. So where do you go? You see this and this, but if you get to the top floor, you find complicated, fissile, dangerous territory, which is what archives mean. The house was built by the Comte Moise de Camondo. The Camondos from Constantinople arrive in the same year as the Afrisi. 1868, they buy land next to each other, Jewish family, also banking. And just like in Vienna, the first house that they built lacks a certain sophistication, but is very much of its period. And Moise's first act when his parents die, again, think of Freud, is to pull his parents' house down and build a new one. And he gives all the Judaica to the Musée de Cluny. And what Moïse does is extraordinary. He marries the very beautiful Irene. Here she is painted, um, painted by, uh, by Renoir at Charles Lefrissi's bequest, the Hest. 
and he builds this extraordinary house, this house which is just full of the most amazing boiseries, the most extraordinary furniture uh, and pictures uh, and, and horses. And he does it because his beloved son Nisim, here shown during the war, is going to inherit and be the next person to hold this extraordinary statement about what it is to be French, to have moved from one country and to become a citizen of another country. But Nisim dies during the First World War. And Moise, at that moment, decides that the whole project has to change. He changes it by making it a museum. He turns his son's room into a mausoleum. He turns the whole house into a place that, at his death, will become this extraordinary exemplar of the best art of the French 18th century, the most civilized century in France, as he puts it, the century in which Jews were given their citizenship. And it becomes this incredible collection. And here is the collection on the death of Moïse de Camondo. And in his will, he says, nothing will be moved. Nothing should change. It should become a museum in honor of my son and the name Camondo will live as an example of French, to the French of our gratitude as a family. And in 1936, in December, anniversary is next week, there's a great ceremony and the house is handed over to the French state. And Beatrice, uh, who's married to my Afrissi cousin, Leon, and their children hand over the house to the French state. And you know what happens next, or if you don't know what happens next, you should. Because what happens is, of course, the systematic and terrible looting of French households, the systematic stripping of rights and freedoms from the citizens of Paris, the rounding up by French policemen of Parisians who are Jewish, and the slow and then the fast minting of new laws the yellow stars not being able to sit on the metro not being able to ride a bicycle not having a radio being home after six and then the deportations to drancy and this is the photograph of my Grandmother's first cousin, Bertrand, with his dog, aged 18, the year before he was rounded up and sent to Drancy. And if you want to see archives, all you need to do is to look hard at these parts of the archive. It's not all lists or furniture. It's not all receipts from Duveen. It's not all those extraordinary photographs of interiors. It's also this. This is part of what archiving a family and a life also means. All four of the family are murdered in Auschwitz and no member of the Camondo family survives. And I'm asked to do something with the house. And what do you do in a house like this? Moise said, don't move anything. So I don't move anything. But briefly for six months, I put objects down, broken objects, vessels, 
and on the desks where they wrote letters, I put small porcelain plaques, small tiny pieces of porcelain on which I have written my letters to Moise de Camonlou in all the different places where archives started, where archives started, I go back and rewrite these places. And in this beautiful Sèvres desk, I just open a drawer and put a small porcelain box with broken shards in it. And in the silver room, I do the same. Where the silver was, I put small pieces of porcelain. And high up in those attics, I open the doors and put vessels down and close the doors again. Not everything has to be seen to have value. Not everything has to be brought into the light to be seen and known about. Things can have a different kind of presence in the world. And so in the courtyard, I put stone benches. And on the stone benches, you can just see, I put a tiny piece of kintsugi, a tiny piece of mending, so that when you sit on the benches and talk, you can reach and find a moment of fracture and a moment of mend mending. These are my Stolpersteine. These are my stumble stones for a family that is no longer there in the Rue de Monceau. You can write books, I write books, but perhaps one of the things that matters to me is this kind of process. So finally, 10 years ago, madly, I bought a broken dinner service. The Klemperer family in Dresden, a great, wonderful, funny, civilized, literate, musical family of collectors, had the greatest private collection of Meissen in Germany. And in 1938, 1939, their house was looted. Some of them escaped. And in 1945, their collection was being taken across Dresden in February during the bombing of Dresden. Much of it was destroyed. And after the war, fragments of these pieces of porcelain were found in the rubble and put in a box. And you know how much East Germany cared about restitution. So they stayed there. And finally, 10 years ago, this collection was restituted to the Klemperer family and they gave much of it away. And some of these fragments came up at an auction, a dinner service of broken mycin. And it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary because you can see the fire marks and you can see the breakage. And so for 10 years, I worked with a Japanese artist, Maiko Tsutsumi, who is an expert on kintsugi. And slowly she has been making these plates, not whole, but different, marking out the lines of fracture and loss. And if you go to the Burlington Arcade, you will see three of these, if you go in the next three weeks. And I took them back to Dresden. And I took them back when the Library of Exile was there. And I put them in vitrines very near to where the house that they were looted from came from. And I simply said that I do not know who they belong to. And that's my point, which is the handing on the storytelling, I simply have no idea who owns what or where it sits in the world. But I do know that that 
long process, that adamantine attention to the absolute particularity of every story is what distinguishes us as people who care in the world. And that's all we can do about handing things on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edmund, for telling us um, this extraordinary story. I was really moved um, listening um, to it. And I could tell by the quality of the silence in the room that um, everyone else here, we were all really very moved. And the contrast between you know, the, the, horror, the horrors of, of the Nazi regime and all this beauty, generosity, knowledge, and um, yeah, the beautiful emotions that were associated with, you know, the, the, the good parts of the story, um, that contrast is, is really very, very striking. And unfortunately, whilst, well, whilst, you know, the story brings us hope, unfortunately, when you, we see the state of the world today, um, well, I think I'm certainly not very optimistic about the future, but that's a different story. Um, now, um, we've come to the end of this um, day, and um, it's, it, it's left to me to um, say um, thank you. Uh, now, let me find my piece of paper so I don't thank, so I thank the right people. Um, well, thank you first, obviously, for um, our wonderful speaker who have given so generously um, to us today and uh, provided so many uh, insights. Thank you to our sponsors. Without them, um, the, today could not have happened uh, in alphabetical order. Christie's, Constantine Cannon, Navigating Art, uh, Philips Fiduciary Services, and Sotheby's. Thank you for Cromwell Place for allowing us to um, hold this event um, uh, today in this um, beautiful room, who used to be the studio of uh, the Irish artist, uh, Sir, Sir John Lavery. Um, it was restored, I think about two or three years ago. And it's, I think it's truly magnificent. I wish I was an artist um, who could um, work in a studio like this. Thank you to our wonderful um, Lucy Skilton, who is um, sitting by the door there. And uh, to our lovely uh, volunteers, Agnese and Emily, who are also sitting there at the back. Um, uh, again, they've done a tremendous job behind the scene and without them, you know, nothing could have happened. And finally, I would like to thank um, uh, Teresa and um, uh, Teresa and Sharon for um, the creativity, energy, and hard work you've put into um, this conference. Um, you've made you've made it effortless, and I think it's an art to make something complex look easy. You've really succeeded at that. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming and for staying until the end. Um, there are drinks um, served um, next door. Uh, before you go, please, please, please have a look at your program. There is a form at the back. Um, we do need your feedback. Uh, you won't be allowed to leave without completing that form. You can leave it on your chair or hand it over to Lucy, who will take it from you. Uh, it's really important to us because we always want to improve and um, your feedback is essential. Thank you very much and see you next door.